participants. Thanks for joining us in this virtual digital economy seminar. We are very much looking forward to our next amazing speaker today, but let me briefly mention the formalities again for the talk. So today's moderator will be Gal Ostreicher at Tel Aviv University, likely well into the day. And uh, so if you have clarification questions during the talk, send these to Gal in the chat window as usual. She will either unmute you or um, she will ask the question directly to Anindya. We will use the same way to collect questions for the Q&A after the talk. And uh, as in the past weeks, the seminar will be recorded and made available on YouTube afterwards. So if you do ask a question yourself, you will also appear in that recording. All right, so uh, I'm very excited to hand over to Gal. And so hi everybody, good morning or good afternoon, depends where you are. Um, I figure Anindo Ghosh from NYU doesn't require any introduction. Um, but so I'll just let you start. I think Anindo said that um, any kind of question is welcome during the talk. So you don't have to limit yourself to clarification questions, but you do have to send me a chat message with your question and then I'll um, unmute you. Um, and Anindo, I guess I'll remind you five minutes before your 45 minutes are over. Okay. okay? Excellent. So the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you, Christian, Hans, and Gal for doing this. And I know this is a large team. Um, also, I see lots of familiar names and faces here. So hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining uh, the session. So um, what I thought I'll do today is present to you some joint work that I've done with uh, Professor Bebe Lee at Carnegie Mellon. I believe Bebe is here in the audience. Um, and uh, Professor Sion Liu at Penn State. Um, and this is essentially work that looks at how to leverage and harness this very granular atomic uh, mobile data that is now available to researchers and to industry practitioners because of the increasing ubiquity of smartphones, right? So I don't think you know, I need to motivate uh, the mere fact that you know, mobile devices are ubiquitous, um, but I think the point of this paper today is to kind of introduce what uh, we are really excited about is some new sort of techniques at the combination of both machine learning and using some large scale field experiments to better understand you know, consumer behavior uh, through these very fine grained digital traces of mobility, okay? So uh, let me start by, uh, you know, sort of giving you uh, the, the high level, you know, what do we know from the literature um, so, you know, as, as many of you have probably experienced, there, there are various kinds of location-based mobile advertising. Uh, there's geo-targeting, there's geo-fencing, geo, geo, -fencing, geo, -geo -fencing. So very broadly put, sort of, you know, geo-targeting is a, a broader kind of mobile targeting where the mobile ads are generated based on real-time location of the customers, okay? Um, geo-fencing is a specific kind of geo-targeting where the ads are triggered by a predefined distance between the user and the store that is trying to target them. Okay? It's used widely by many offline retailers. Like I said, perhaps you've seen this in shopping malls or department stores or even in airports uh, for transit passengers. Um, and geoconquesting is essentially you know, where rival stores can try to poach on each other's customers in order to kind of and essentially you know, um, increase the market share and revenue and so on, okay? So between the marketing and the tech literature, there's a number of papers um, that have started to dig deep inside this. And, and he, this is only, you know, this is not a representative sample. Uh, this is uh, just, uh, this is not an exhaustive sample. It's a representative sample um, to give you a sense for, you know, what are the different aspects of mobile targeting that have been looked at, okay? Um, and uh, a couple of years back, some of you probably know uh, that I wrote a book on this and I'll talk a little more about that. Um, but the basic idea is that all these prior papers have essentially used what we call static location, right? So your real time location, but it is essentially just where you are, as opposed to thinking about something that is looking at your prior trajectory. Um, so not just where you are right now, but also where you were in the immediate preceding minutes or hours. Okay? So the best analogy I can think of is, you know, if you are familiar with the clickstream literature in, in marketing and in the IT field and, and some in the econ field as well, 
um, you know, um, you know that we what we do over there is we extract and study essentially using the fixed stream data um, how consumers navigate from website to website and from within a uh, website from page to page, right? So this is going to be a similar idea, except that you know we are going to do this in the offline world. We're going to try to examine how consumers move from store to store, um, and use that information to better understand their preferences and, and their you know taste and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's what I mean by trajectory. Um, so to give you a high-level overview of the literature, so what do we know about the literature? So. The literature across these multiple fields in econ and marketing and IT, et cetera, have essentially identified nine forces that are shaping this mobile economy. And this was the subject of the book that I've written. Um, and so, uh, you know, what I talk about is based on the academic research that many of us here in the audience have also done. Um, location data on its own is not sufficient in trying to extract essentially, you know, the, the maximum customer information. So it is useful, but it's not, uh, you know, sufficient. So one of the things we know is that because of the granularity of location data, uh, you can accentuate that with additional sort of layers of data and get more information. So, you know, you can get information about location and the time when the person was there. And then by combining the two, you know, their context. Um, you can also know what the weather is like in real time and assuming and his quarters have done some work in that front. Uh, you can know uh, whether the users are in crowded context or in isolated context. Uh, and Michelle, Schumming and I have done some work in that front. So there are these nine forces and today what I'm going to emphasize for the most part is the sixth force, the trajectory force. Uh, partly because, you know, uh, Bebe, Siwan and I uh, believe that this we'll see more and more of this sort of targeting in the future uh, because the infrastructure requirements uh, ha are not as tedious as they used to be. Um, and we see now sort of adoption of this targeting in, in different parts of the world, not just in Asia where things are generally ahead of the curve, uh, but I've seen this in the Middle East, in some parts of the US, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, the Mall of America started doing this uh, and so on. Okay. So, so uh, that's going to be, you know, the, the broad overview. So we, our goal essentially is to come up with a new mobile advertising strategy, okay, that leverages not only static location information, but also the trajectory of the consumer in the immediate, you know, past sessions, okay. Um, and then, uh, so we're going to use some machine learning techniques to sort of combine that data to come up with some sort of clustering and similarity uh, quantification of customers. And then we're going to use that in some large scale field experiments. And okay? so, because our eventual goal is really to uh, quantify, you know, how impactful this new technique can be or is compared to existing benchmarks uh, that, like location based targeting. Okay. Okay, so um, in case you know I, I uh, end up not finishing in this talk, I just want to give you a summary of what we do. So. Uh, we collaborate with a very large shopping mall in Asia. It's actually located in Beijing. It's the, uh, one of the world's largest shopping malls. It has about 300 stores and it gets about 100,000 people every day, uh, especially during the weekdays. Um, so we ran this experiment over a two week period, uh, 14 consecutive days. We got about 84,000 approximate user responses. Uh, and the main findings are essentially bucketed into sort of two categories. Um, at the customer level, we find that this new targeting, uh, advertising targeting strategy leads to higher redemption rates for the coupons that are sent. Uh, people on an average spend more money. Uh, they also redeem things faster uh, than the existing sort of targeting techniques. Uh, the focal stores that are participating in these, they benefit, uh, and so does the mall. Um, but there's also a lot of heterogeneity in terms of, you know, what really works and what doesn't work. So, for example, uh, this new targeting technique works well on weekdays. It doesn't really work as well on the weekends when you compare this with other kinds of targeting. And so we borrow, you know, the, the theories from social psychology and consumer behavior literature to kind of disentangle the mechanisms here, like what might be going on on weekend versus weekdays. Um, okay. We also have a lot of data on demographics, uh, like income, 
and you know, a credit card spending behavior. And one of the things we find is that this kind of targeting technique tends to work better for the higher income customers, okay? Which then has, as you can imagine, it'll have some interesting implications for uh, customer lifetime value, right? So, uh, because the literature in the past, uh, think about the work Peter or B. Kumar, they've shown that high income generally leads to high customer lifetime value, okay? Okay, so that's sort of the, uh, the, the set of goals. So I'll follow this five-step uh, framework. Uh, I'll first talk about the clustering techniques, then I'll talk about the targeting approach. I'll describe the field experiments, then I'll talk about the, uh, the model, very simple logic-like models, and then I'll sort of talk about a little bit of the existing uh, and the future work. Um, and again, let me know anytime you have any questions, happy to stop. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot going on in this paper, so I'm, I might uh, have to speed up at some point, but uh, if I miss on something, just let me know. Okay, so let me just visualize this problem for you. Okay, so this is a large shopping mall, um, <clears throat> right? Now imagine, can you see the Apple store here? So I just put the red dot in front of the Apple store. So in the past, right, uh, many sort of individual stores in a, in a mall would use what we call just pure location-based targeting, meaning that if the Apple believes that Apple believes that these people right in front of the Apple store, they're standing there for a while and Apple thinks, okay, they might be interested in the Apple store, okay? So if you, they're just using location-based targeting, they're gonna send them some offers. But it's also possible, right, that these people are just using the Apple store as a landmark to meet their friends, and they really have no interest in buying anything from Apple, okay? But what if, right, so, so pure location-based targeting can generate a bunch of, like, false positives, right? But what if Apple knew that before they came to the Apple store, these people, those three gentlemen, they first went to the Samsung store on the third floor, then they went to the Xiaomi store on the second floor. Then they went to the Google Pixel store on the first floor. And then they went to another competing store, maybe the Huawei store. And then they came to the Apple store on the fourth floor, right? So that is what I mean by trajectory, okay? So if Apple knows that these gentlemen went to five other or four other competing stores in the same category, that's a lot more informative for them, right? So now they have a better sense for the fact that these people are probably interested in, in the electronics category, probably in the smartphones, but they're only going to the smartphone stores. And it seems like they haven't quite found what they wanted. And so now it's a great sort of opportunity for them to, uh, you know, surprise them or delight them, right? So, um, so that's, that's sort of the trajectory information. So let's talk about how this is actually done, right? So what we do in this paper is we go through three steps. First, we have to define a community of similar customers, um, defined as those people who have similar trajectories in the first you know, 10, 15 minutes of their, of their entry into the mall. Then we're gonna define based on the trajectories, they're gonna define similarity. So let's say, you know, uh, let's say, you know, Gal, you've been frequenting this mall and I am a new customer, right? So Gal and Christian and Heinz are frequenting the mall, I'm a new customer. So when I first walk in, um, the mall is going to try to ascertain how similar or dissimilar is my sort of behavior compared to the existing database of the customers. So we're gonna be looking at, you know, are, am I visiting similar stores as you guys? Am I visiting at the same time? Am I looking at uh, weekend or weekday? What happened to the, can you still see my screen? Um, something happened yeah, I think my... we can, it's like, okay, now we can. Okay, it just blacked out for a while. Uh, <laughs> So we're gonna look at pairwise similarity based on you know, visiting different stores at different points of time in the day, different days of the week. And then we're going to use that to you, uh, using graph-based clustering, we're going to try to assign similarity scores between new customers and existing customers, okay? So how do we do this? All of this data comes from the mobile phone, right? So we are going to, um, we're going to essentially, oh, I don't know, it, it keeps blanking out on my end for some reason. Um, 
Can you guys still see the screen? Okay. I think uh, you just have to be patient. Okay. Because okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna use four dimensions of their traveling patterns to ascertain the score. First, we're gonna look at the starting and the ending times, okay, of uh, the, when they first entered the mall and they exited the mall. We're gonna look at what day of the week, is it morning, afternoon, evening, night, et cetera. Then we're gonna look at uh, spatial um, alignments. And I see somebody write, <laughs> writing on the screen. Uh, it's really um, so then we're gonna look at spatial alignments, um, something funky is happening here. Okay, then we're going to look at spatial alignments, then we'll look at semantics, um, and such as what are the different stores that the user is going to, how much time they're spending at these stores, what is the visit probability of each of these sites, um, and what is the speed at which they are actually going from store to store, okay? So the overall goal is for us to find out if you have two customers, okay, customer I and customer I prime. So let's say this is I is, you know, Gal, this is you, the new customer. Then we will try to find how similar is this new customer to the existing customer based on these different four different dimensions of traveling within the mall itself, okay? And finally, we are then going to use the similarity score to then target the new customer with similar offers as the existing customer. Okay, okay so um, we will then, uh, let's go to the randomized field experiment. Okay. So we are gonna talk about a large shopping mall in Asia. This has about 1.3 million square feet. Um, this has about 300 stores. It gets about 100,000 visitors per day and it gets about 200,000 visitors during the holidays, okay? So the question is, how do we get this data, right? So the way this will work is we're gonna use the Wi-Fi system. So as soon as the user, the consumer enters the mall, we will give them the option and say, look, um, in a lot, of, a lot of the malls and department stores, especially you lose the Wi-Fi internet connection when you walk in. And so we will essentially be looking at um, giving them access to the internet using the Wi-Fi. So you need a user ID and password, and then we'll give them an option to opt in or opt out and say, look, if you opt in, then we will use your Wi-Fi data to send you these mobile targeting offers. And you still can use the Wi-Fi if you decide to opt out, then you're not gonna get these offers. Okay, so it's a choice sort of uh, option. Uh, we will give consumers the choice of opting in or opting out. Okay? Okay, so, uh, oops, this one again. Um, okay, so I think I have this right, somebody has this right to another, give me a second. Um, um, all right, I can't figure this what the right one it is. Um, all right, let's just uh, do it. Security or options and select. Okay. Can you see my screen here? Not at the moment. Okay, it's blacked out again. I think somehow, uh, you know, this, somebody has control on the annotation. Maybe you can unshare your screen and share again. Again, okay. Sorry, guys. Okay, can you see it now? Yes. Yes. Okay, so uh, let's talk about the experiment itself. Okay? So at the entrance of the shopping mall, right, if the consumer, uh, again, feel free to ask me if I uh, skip some details, right? If you want me to pause, if there's any question, let me know. Um, 
So at the entrance of the shopping mall, um, if the consumer wants to enjoy the free Wi-Fi, right, um, when they're given the user ID password, we also ask them to fill out a form. Okay, the form has some uh, questions about demographics, like age and gender and income, etc. Um, and then when they're actually buying something at any given store, right, then people will also be asked to fill out the same form, asking the same questions. And then we're gonna cross cross validate that, right? So uh, just for the purpose of accuracy. Now, in addition to that, uh, for each of the stores, you're also getting what they purchase, what they're actually buying from the stores, for example, through the loyalty card data. So if you have a, about 70% or so of the small customers have a loyalty card. So anytime you buy something using the loyalty card, uh, you know, we can get, we are getting that data from the individual stores, okay? Okay, so let's talk about the, uh, the experimental design, right? So we have essentially, again, just a high level goal is we're trying to compare this new trajectory-based targeting, okay, that we just, I just talked about that versus uh, two treatments, which are essentially where people get random offers and another treatment where we are sending you location-based offers, okay? Now, the control group is the one that's doing nothing. Obviously, you know, we, we want to, one of the, you know, the big um, main issues with mobile targeting or any sort of digital advertising is, you know, you want to show that any sales is incremental over and above what would have happened anyway, right? So it's really important to uh, sort of, you know, curate the design of the experiment so that you have a control group whose sales uh, purchases you can observe, but they're not buying because they're getting any offers, okay? So these, this is basically uh, the setup. And how we go about doing this is on each day, so we, have this, we do this over two weeks, right? Uh, we're going to randomly assign 6,000 consumers to each of the four groups. Um, over 14 days, we end up got, getting about roughly 83,370 unique user responses. Um, the, uh, there were 300 stores in the mall, but only 200, uh, you know, most of them participated. So we got about 252 stores to participate with us. Um, and just for better understanding consumer sort of, you know, psychology, we looked at uh, two different kinds of coupons. So let's say uh, one kind of coupon might have the percentage mentioned in the coupon, like 50% off or 20% off. And the other kind of coupon uh, might say, hey, buy one, get one free, okay? Then now, how do we you know, um, uh, start the targeting? So as soon as a customer walks in, so we wait for let's say about 10 minutes and we will look at you know, a little more 10, 15 minutes. And then after observing their store visitation behavior for the first 10 minutes, then we start sending them some sort of offer, okay? Okay, now um, how this offer is sent is, you know, if you are, uh, imagine when you travel to airports and you're sitting in a lounge or even in the airport, right? When you log into Wi-Fi, right? A browser pops up on your device and it says, hey, this is a user ID password. You've got to fill that out. So that's the kind of technology. It looks like an SMS text, okay? Um, uh, but it's also, it can be enabled through the browser. And the reason I mentioned this is because, you know, different countries have different regulations, right? So in some cases you can send a marketing offer through SMS. In some cases you might have to send the offer through the browser. The browser pops up just like an SMS. Um, what was important was we wanted to make sure that this cannot be forwarded to other customers, right? So if you get the offer, you're the only one who can redeem it, okay? And again, just to make sure we're comparing apples to apples, uh, the the T1 treatment group only getting random offers, they get the exact same promotions in terms of the format and the price discount, except uh, that it's randomly targeted, uh, meaning that, hey, you might be in front of the Starbucks store, but you get an offer for, you know, the Tumi, the luggage company. Okay, so that's kind of a random offer, right? So location offer is you get the Apple offer because you're in front of Apple. And then we have the trajectory, which means that we are looking at all the stores that you've been going to, uh, and then how similar or dissimilar you are to existing customers, and then we send to the office, okay? Um, before you move on, Anina, we have one question from Aruna. Sure. Yeah. 
So the first question was uh, typically the Wi-Fi that's uh, eligible when you enter into the shopping malls. There is a limited duration during which it's valid, right? So what is the time period uh, during which the free Wi-Fi is being browsed by the customers? It's a great question. Uh, so in this particular mall, uh, there was no sort of limitation on the actual uh, time zone in terms of time duration. Um, and uh, one of the things, other thing we observe is, and you'll see some of this, that the typical shopping duration, uh, you know, in this mall was, at least on the weekdays, was about just a little less than an hour. On the weekend, it was a little more. Um, but just exactly because of the point that you raised, uh, we were able to convince the mall not to have any sort of constraint on how much time uh, they would have the Wi-Fi uh, available. All right. I have one more question. Uh, for the uh, treatment group T3, is there a higher threshold after which the promotions get triggered? One is static and one is trajectory-based. So do you wait for more data to kick in before the promotions are being sent in the treatment group 3? It's a great question again. So you're exactly right. There is a trade-off. So, you know, so what we did is we looked at the first 10 minutes of the customer's trajectory, and then we send them the trajectory-based offers. Same goes for, you know, the, the first 10 minutes for random or promotion. We did sort of look at a little bit of sensitivity analysis by looking at slightly longer windows, like first 15 minutes, first 20 minutes. The trade-off, uh, Arun, as you were thought about rightly is the following, right? So the longer you wait, the more data you get on the customer, but the less time you have to make the intervention work for the customer, right? Um, and, and so that's why, you know, we sort of had to contain ourselves within the first 10 to 20 minutes. Because uh, if we waited longer, you know, we would have gotten even more information, but then we probably would have lost some of these purchases, right? So, so that's the trade out there. Okay, thank you. We have one more question from Emil. Uh, hello, thank you for the presentation. I have a question regarding the user interaction with the messages. Yeah. So if, it's, uh, if the message is opening up in a browser, can you able to track if the user is closing it as soon as it pops up or user waits, reads it, and then closes it so that you can track the interaction in time frame? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you're exactly right. So there are, um, you know, in this case, we found, um, I don't have the, the click-through rate numbers with me, but we can ascertain whether the consumer clicked on the SMS and uh, opened it. Um, and we can also ascertain if they closed that window, we can see that. Um, there is some heterogeneity there, uh, but the vast majority of people who've opted in to receive the offers, you see that they actually end up seeing the offer uh, and then deciding. They may not act on it, but we definitely see the majority of them seeing the offer. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let me just show the high level results and then I'll talk about the individual level results. So here is, uh, you see that we're comparing the control group with the three treatment groups, random location trajectory on, on different metrics. So uh, first and foremost, I think of interest to us would be the redemption rate, right? So clearly trajectory-based targeting is seeing a much better redemption rate, almost twice that of random. Um, the other interesting thing is that people are also more efficient in how they respond and purchase based on this. So here you see that in the trajectory-based offer, they are responding uh, in terms of redeeming the offer within the first five minutes, four minutes, you know, uh, 4.55 minutes, uh, which is also much faster than the other offers, okay? So part of what is really going on is, if you think about this, you know, uh, the reason this efficiency can come through is if the algorithm is able to really extract your preferences or taste and target you with the right offer, then it's almost like it's reading your mind, right? Um, and you know, part of the reason we hypothesize this is happening is because of that. Okay? Um, and again, you know, one of the important things to note here would be uh, if you look at this column, the total money spent in the mall, right? So, like I said, uh, you know, it's important to sort of make sure that 
um, any effects you see from the targeting is incremental over and above what would have happened for people who would have bought anyway. So this column, the total money spent in the mall, you see the control group is spending about $85 on an average. And you compare this with the random, uh, it's slightly higher, but significantly higher is the location targeting. And of course, even higher is the trajectory, okay? Um, okay, can you hear me? Yeah, I, th I think I, I muted you, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, it was you. I thought I finally got in. <laughs> <I know. laughs> okay. Um, so this column here is, uh, I just want to emphasize, is an important sanity check that goes to show that it is truly an incremental effect we are capturing, and it's not just, you know, people who have bought it anyway, okay? Um, so other good news is that people are spending more time and money in the mall. As you can see, they're spending about 72 minutes on an average, courtesy this. Uh, and this, this is somewhat uh, goes to, Aruna, your question about, you know, is, was there a time limit? Uh, you see on an average, they're spending up to an hour, but for trajectory, uh, we are able to make them deviate a little more and make them visit a couple more stores. Uh, and that, you know, ends up getting additional time. The good news of the mall again is they're spending uh, for the focal stores, as you can see, they're spending more sort of uh, money in the focal stores uh, and they're also spending more money in the mall. Okay, so overall the satisfaction rate uh, is also higher. And, and just to be clear, we, aside from the field experiments uh, where we are sending them offers on their phones, we also followed up subsequent the purchases, we followed up with a survey on, on this using the same phone ID. Okay? Uh, to get their satisfaction rate. Okay, so what we got from the group level analysis was helpful. Uh, we also have some demographics. I won't uh, get into the details here, uh, but you can see that not surprisingly, you know, the, the older customers are showing the lower redemption rates. So people in the age of 40 to 50 have the lowest redemption rates. Younger people are more likely to redeem offers. So that was something you would have expected. Um, and uh, the other interesting thing is that trajectory group was seeing, we were able to get more redemptions from the higher income customers on an average, if you look at this income bracket compared to the other brackets, okay? Okay, so. Um, yeah. Before we move on, we have two questions. Is this a good time? Yeah. Okay, um, Sai is asking, what if customers in, T in T3 were already planning to shop for those particular stores. The store might be losing out on promotions on those customers. How is this accounted for? Yeah, so I, I think this is you know part of why we have the sort of this control group of people, right? So we want to look at they these customers in T3. Yes, some of them may have uh, wanted to purchase from the same store, but what we are seeing is if you look at this focal table we are able to make them buy even more from the store. So, you know, if, if they were, let's say, going to spend, let's say, let's say $25 into focal store. Now, because of the promotions, we were able to, uh, you know, influence them or persuade them to buy even more. And that number, that's why you see the number goes up, um, you know, about roughly two times, a little more than two times. Okay. And also a question from Lomas. Um, yeah, and then yeah, uh, on the screen on the um, slide that's up right now, for those dollars you know spent, uh, the time spent, is that for the entire, uh, say the T entire T three group, or only for the redeemers within the T three group? It's not clear. Right, good question. Uh, it is only for the people who are redeeming, Larry. Okay. Uh, Okay. And we also have a question from Maja. Yeah. 
Oh, so my question, a clarifying question, is actually how does tracking of spendings of the control group on, for those who do not redeem work? So I guess that this is about the clone closeness of the mobile phone to the cashier while paying. But then how about if, you know, a group of people like friends enter together the mall, but then they receive different treatments and then, you know, one is buying, another is buying. Um, right. Yeah. Great question. So uh, there's a two part answer. For the first part, uh, we are getting data for the control customers from the point of sale. Okay, so let's say the control. So one example of this is people, about 70% of the customers have a loyalty card. So when the control group is using a loyalty card, you know, to get points or discounts or, or coupons, you know, we have that information. We also know that they were not part of any of the treatments. Okay. Uh, the second thing is uh, what you raise is also very interesting. What happens when people are going with a group of family or friends? And in fact, you know, that's a, the follow-up paper, which I probably won't have time to get into. Uh, but thank you for raising this question. In the follow-up work, what we've done is we have designed the same set of experiments, but teased out a group, an individual customer's behavior versus a group of two, group of three, uh, if you're with family or friends, um, and in case I don't get to this, uh, there's the paper that is linked on the website. Uh, it's called Nudging Customers. Uh, you know, if you could take a look, uh, that would give you some information on that. Um, we have one more question from Emil. Okay, Let's sure. Just unmuting. Um, yes, Emil. Again, uh, yes. hello again. Uh, can we uh, go back to the table previously? Is that yeah? Uh, my question is regarding the regarding the time spent in the store and overall money spent in the store. Mm -hmm. I can see there is like kind of a significant difference between T2 and T3 groups. Mm -hmm. If you calculate like money spent per minute, is there any explanation uh, for that? Yes. Uh, yeah. So what, uh, you know, uh, the paper has most of the other details, but one of the things we have been able to do is we can also see how many additional stores does do people in T3 go compared to T2 or T1, okay? Um, so part of the reason why you're seeing them being able to spend more money in the mall is because we're able to change uh, what their original path was and make them deviate and go to additional stores. Okay? Uh, now, once they are within the store, uh, the reason they are spending little time is because the, tree, the trajectory algorithm is really kind of sort of able to read their mind, right? Because we know that you went to, let's say, you know, the Gucci store and the Prada store and the Armani store, and now you're in the Burberry store. So the algorithm says, we have a sense for, uh, you know, what you really are looking for. And so instead of just sending you any random offer within the store, we will send you an offer only for the specific product category that we believe you're looking for. Uh, and, and that's what is making this process more efficient. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Hi, Anand, I have one more question here. Uh, uh, Shiram here. Uh, so uh, the fact that these customers visited in T3, they visited the competitors, right? So maybe they didn't find anything attractive there. And so uh, is it possible that they had a high chance of buying from the focal I lost the last part, Shidam. So you said. So the question is uh, uh, they visited competitor stores mm -hmm. and probably they didn't find anything attractive. Mm -hmm. And so they came to this local store. And so they had a higher chance of purchasing compared to T2 customers, right? On average. Is that okay. possible? Uh, yes. So part of so this, within the treatment group, right, we see uh, the trajectory group, we see multiple kinds of people, right? So there are some people, like you said, you know, this person went to you know, uh, uh, Google, App, uh, Xiaomi, Samsung, Huawei, and then came to Apple. He didn't buy anything to sit in stores, right? Uh, and that's why Apple knows that, you know, they're probably a good target for sending a product uh, in a category or in a, uh, in, a, in a product that is common to all five. So yes, uh, most customers who end up buying will have not been satisfied with something they've seen earlier in the other stores. But there are also some customers who have bought something from a competing category of stores. But when they come to the final store, 
our algorithm is able to make them buy something additional, okay, on over and above <clears throat> what they bought from the competing store. So you can uh, then look at you know uh, both these customers and see how much of an incremental effect is the trajectory truly having. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. And you know we have five more minutes before the Q and A, so I'm going to stop taking questions. And um, if you guys have questions, you can text me, and we'll keep them for five minutes to let you finish first. Okay, uh, I might need a little more than five minutes, uh, but I'll try. Um, okay, okay. Uh, you know, um, just sort of uh, to give you a sense, we um, after the initial sort of uh, you know group level analysis, we we'll look at you know some simple individual level choice models, um, and you know, the results here are informative because, for example, you see that trajectory based targeting on an average does significantly better than location. Okay, so random here is the base, right? Um, we see that um, the week ends are better than week days um, when you just on an average, but when you interact with trajectory, you will see at the bottom, the trajectory base targeting does better on week days, but not on the weekends. Uh, we have some demographic information. So you know, age has a negative and diminishing return. Uh, women generally are redeeming more than men. Okay, so one of the things that's worth pointing out is, um, you know, the weekend effect. So the weekend effect is something that we have seen in, you know, many other sort of disciplines, like people in finance have talked about weekend effects, people in consumer psychology have talked about weekend effects. So why does trajectory doesn't work so well on the weekends? So our hypothesis is sort of backed by, you know, the social psychology and the consumer psychology literature is that on the weekends, a lot of customers for them, a trip to the mall is like a family trip, right? Or, or trip with friends. And they are happy to explore and they are, they are not really concerned about, you know, efficiency and get in, get out. That's sort of a mindset. So on the weekend, we actually seeing them uh, that they are much better responding to other sort of offers, okay? And, and so one of the caveats with this trajectory-based targeting that, you know, when we talk to a company and say, look, it's working great on weekdays, but be careful on the weekends, you may not see the same results, okay? Because people are you know, really not thinking so much about this efficiency of shopping because they're in a mindset, it's a social trip, okay? Uh, <clears throat> we look at, um, other things we look at are individual spending in the focal store. I've talked a little bit about this. The results again are consistent, you know, looking at trajectory versus location versus random. These are better, uh, again, weekend on trajectory. Uh, weekend in general better than weekend, weekday, but the interaction with trajectory uh, changes that. Um, so the focal store, we didn't find much heterogeneity in terms of the direct effect. They're always benefiting. Uh, for the overall spending in the mall, again, uh, you know, there is more heterogeneity here. Uh, like I've said, the, the key takeaway by looking at, you know, the weekend weekday effects was that trajectory was less effective during the weekend. Okay? Uh, random, in fact, was more effective. Um, so to, just to summarize the main, main uh, findings here, uh, right, um, and I have one other thing to talk about, uh, it's a question raised by, I think it was Aruna. Uh, and so the main findings here is that on an average, we are seeing that this new targeting technique based on your, you know, uh, multi-store visit behavior uh, is leading to higher redemption rates, more spending, faster redemption, and higher satisfaction. Um, the focal stores is benefiting. Uh, like I said, the incremental effect, this is truly the incremental effect because we have a control group of people who don't end up getting any sort of offers. Okay? So um, the final thing I want to talk about is uh, another you know, question raised, which is, you know, uh, what happens when you have, you know, customers of different uh, types, like somebody might go to shop alone, somebody might go in a group of two, some uh, like a couple, somebody might grow with a group of family and friends. So, um, so I won't have the chance, unfortunately, to get into details, uh, but again, it's there in the paper, the links on the website. But suffice it to say that the initial setup is going to be the same, right? So we have the same side of machine learning based clustering techniques that uses the subgraph detection. Then what you see is we are able to identify whether it's a group of two or three or four versus a single customer 
by mapping the trajectory of these people, every, thir every 30 seconds, the Wi-Fi system is splitting and giving us latitude, longitude. So we can map if these two people are going around together or not. Um, and so what we do is uh, we also have to obviously, you know, keep in mind that some people are just co-located. They just, they're not together from a literal sense, but they just have very similar shopping patterns. So we have like four treatment groups here. Okay, so single, you know, dyad, uh, triad, and co-located. Uh, the setup was very similar. So we ran this over sort of three weeks with 52,000 responses. Um, and uh, this, uh, you know, we also have a control group, right? So it's a classic sort of a different diff setup because we have a control group of people who don't get any of these offers, okay? Um, but we can, within the control group, we have similar single customers, dyadic, triadic, and co-located. Okay, so there's two levels of uh, differences here. The first difference in the different diff is the baseline difference in spending amongst the different social contexts, right? So imagine in your, uh, you know, um, you have these four kinds, right? So uh, single versus dual, dyad versus triad, and co-located. And the second diff is looking at the effect of the intervention between the control and the treatment group. Okay. Um, so the, you know, what we find is that on an average, right, uh, there is you know, significant heterogeneity in how consumers are behaving when they're shopping alone or shopping with family or friends. Uh, the redemption rates and the amount spending tends to go up when they are in groups of uh, three or even when they are uh, with somebody else as opposed to when they're shopping alone. Um, so generally there is a positive trend. Um, and just to be clear, it's hard to do this uh, you know, beyond a certain number of people. So uh, beyond three people together, like if you come in a large group of five or six, then our method is not gonna work because then it's too noisy. You know? So the mapping of five customers simultaneously using the Wi-Fi data becomes noisy. So, so we li limit ourselves to up to three people. Um, and that still gives us sort of you know, enough of a representative sample of people who come with a family or friend and so on. Okay, so I just wanna end by saying that, uh, you know, we um, are sort of, what we think our contributions here is that, look, these, um, uh, this paper is able to show us, you know, how to extract like very fine grained customer preferences from these uh, atomic mobile data. Um, and our goal here was to say, look, the literature uh, in economics and IT and marketing done a fabulous job in looking at, you know, the, the, the baseline measures of targeting, like mobile uh, location targeting or targeting based on uh, random offers or, or other things. And we want to try something different and sort of, you know, that's where uh, we thought this is worth pursuing. Um, so the results are promising, you know, they are giving you uh, what your intuition would expect. The more information you have, the better uh, it gets. But again, there's some caveats. Uh, the, the demographic, uh, you know, results tell us when these things work better or, or not. Uh, we also know that uh, trajectory doesn't work as well on the weekend as opposed to weekday. So that's an important sort of a caveat to inform the businesses uh, in terms of targeting. Um, and I think uh, one of the, uh, just a quick mention that uh, because these sort of techniques involve uh, a significant trade-off of consumer data and privacy, um, again, with uh, Bebe and Natasha and Meghna, uh, we're working on some privacy papers uh, that help advertisers get higher returns using less data, okay? So, so if you're interested in a piece, feel free to just email me. I'm happy to send you our working graphs. Uh, and we hope, uh, you know, there's some promising, interesting ideas uh, in this stream of work. So, so let me stop here, Gal, uh, and happy to take questions. Excellent, we have some questions already. Um, Nati, would you like to go first? Sure, thanks, Cal. Uh, thanks, Anandya, for the presentation. One thing I was thinking about, this reminded me of your work on commuter versus non-commuter behaviors. And that's also a lot about movement. When people are on the go, are they more likely to redeem coupons versus not? How do you sort of integrate uh, these two broad ideas of movement pattern as well as where they have been in the past? Because it seems like in this paper, you're looking more at 
which stores they have visited on that specific trip to the mall, but not so much their history of have they been to the mall before, their familiarity with the store, which I presume would also play a role. So that's the first part. The second kind of like a short question is more, do you see any differences across store types? And are these effects more strong versus weak for certain types of stores and product categories? Right. Great question. Thanks, Anuti. So I'll take a second one first. Yes. Yeah, so um, we also did a bunch of analysis to look at the you know, store level heterogeneity, you know, store level fixed effects, uh, and so on. Yes, you're right. The intuition is right. There are certain stores where these offers tend to work better. For example, you know, fashion category or uh, fast food and, and beverages. You know, there are certain product categories where these offers uh, tend to work better, um, both in terms of like predicted, you know, uh, consistent buying and impulse buying. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so they stay in the paper. Uh, I, I didn't get a chance to talk about that. Um, the first question is also great one. In fact, you're absolutely right, right? So here, in my previous work, um, you know, both the papers and the one with uh, my collaborators in South Korea, Won Seik and Dong Wong and Eric, we had looked at, you know, commuters versus non-commuters. And then my work with Michelle and Shuming, we had done that in China with subway train commuters. The main difference Imati, is that in those contexts, right, we are only looking at the immediate context, whether it's, you know, like crowdedness of the immediate subway train or your immediate location and maybe combining that with the time. Uh, but we did not have information on, you know, what are the other stores in the city that the person is going to. What we do over here is we say, you know, once you're inside the mall or the department store, right, it becomes easier for the institution to kind of you know, monitor your trajectory and sort of track your movement. Mm -hmm. That gives you the additional information to do this sort of uh, uh, targeting. And, um, and do you see their trajectory change? I think you had some results on they're now visiting more number of stores as uh, well. Exactly right. So on average, we see, if I remember correctly, about 2.5 extra stores mm -hmm. uh, with, with the trajectory-based targeting compared to the random and, and the location. So, mm -hmm. so there's some good news there that you're able to change their behavior over and above, you know, what they would have done anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Um, Anand? Uh, hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, hi, and India, very interesting talk. So my question is that the trajectory is uh, more than just a collection of stores. There's a time pattern, uh, sequencing of stores. Did you use that to target stores or did you see any uh, outcome in the redeem rate based on the order they followed? Yes, great question. Thank you, Anand, for raising it. I had to speed up a little bit. You're absolutely right. We do have four dimensions of trajectory-based targeting and the one you're talking about is semantic, right? So suppose, uh, you know, you only use the semantic dimension. Yes, in, in, in fact, we've also done the analysis where we compare when you only use one dimension versus when you use multiple combinations. And um, I, I sense your intuition was spot on that the most important dimension of these four is the semantic dimension, which is that the maximum buck a return on investment comes from the information over here. Okay. Um, Abhishek? Yeah, hi, Anindya. Abhishek here. Um, hi. I, had a, I had a question regarding the effect of the uh, promotion or the discounts. So I was wondering, is it the effect, I mean, how can you disentangle the effect of the promotions from consumer fatigue? So there, say consumers are, you know, have been running around the store, they've been in five stores. So how do you actually disentangle the effect of the trajectory-based promotion versus just consumer fatigue, you know, just hanging around the mall and they want to get something next, yeah. Yeah, great, great question, Abhishek. So, you know, one of the things we do know from the digital marketing literature is that there's an inverse U-shaped relationship between the number of offers you get and your probability of sale, of purchase, right? Okay. So um, there is a paper that we had done uh, with Vilma Todri, who's now a professor at Emory University, where we had shown that, uh, and Parangir Singh, where we had shown that uh, the sweet spot, okay, for like, you know, digital ads or mm -hmm. coupons, it is four to six, meaning that um, you don't want to send more than four, and in some cases, six, coupons or ads, otherwise people are gonna get fatigued, they're gonna get annoyed, 
So there's too much notification, right? Mm -hmm. So um, in this paper, we did not look at sort of the, you know, what is the optimal number of offers to send to a given customer. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it, it, I, I'm just sort of smiling to myself because this is something that, you know, Bebe and Siwan and I had talked about and discussed internally that our next paper should be about not just how many offers to send so that there is no fatigue, mm -hmm. but also what is the sequence with which the offers order should be offered to be sent and also the time lag between the offers, you see? Mm -hmm. Like a three-part question, obviously, right? So um, unfortunately, we haven't gotten to that yet, but hopefully, uh, you know, someday we'll, we'll get our act together and, and get that done. Um, Emilio? Hi. I want to know if this experiment can be used in airports because yeah. the, the time is the, uh, different there. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, okay. So you want to you want me to answer how to use in the airports? Right. Okay. Yeah. So, so um, what we've done is um, there is a, a project I did with airports in the Middle East where we are looking at um, you know the uh, passenger transit passenger flow. And you know how if you're a transit passenger, you've got a couple of hours to kill and instead of sitting in the lounge, you know, you want to sit in the airport, then the retail establishments in the airport are good candidates like duty-free stores or restaurants, right? To target these transit passengers with sort of the right offer at the right time. Um, and the way this would work is uh, when you sign on to the airport Wi-Fi, right? Again, the browser pops up, you enter your user ID password and you sign in. The browser can be used as a mechanism by the retail stores in the airport to send you an offer. Okay, um, and uh, and that's how uh, you know because we, we don't want to necessarily use SMS or anything of that sort. And maybe there's no app because you know if you're a transit passenger, you're not going to download an app for the airport just like that. But the good news is now that the browser can be used. Like if you have a Safari or a Chrome or Internet Explorer, we have you know send you people offers through the browser. So that's how we've done this in like, uh, you know, non sort of city, uh, non retail establishments uh, in context like airports, or uh, you can also think of this like large train stations, you know, um, you, can, you can do this as well. Okay, next we have from um, Pranav. Yeah, hi Anandir. Uh, I have a question about the randomization over here and how we should interpret uh, the results. So in terms of allocation to different uh, treatment and control groups, uh, are we, is it the case that we're following the trajectory of each consumer and conditional on the trajectory? So if two consumers have exactly the same trajectory, then they're equally likely to be in one of the four uh, groups. Is that the case? Or is allocation to uh, T3 based on trajectory, whereas T1 and T2 could be just based on location person. Right, so the, the way the experiment runs is, you know, the, you've got the three treatment groups. So we will basically observe the initial trajectory of all people in the three treatment groups. And then we'll randomly allocate each person to either the, rand, the location-based targeting or the random targeting or the trajectory-based targeting. In other words, we are not necessarily using uh, the information from the first 10 minutes of their walking to decide uh, you know, which group they should go to. Because then you're gonna bias your results, right? Um, so that's why it's important that you observe these people for the first 10 minutes, and then you randomly put them into three groups, uh, and then you observe their actions thereafter. So, so if I, I guess I'll rephrase my question. If, if there are two people who's standing in front of Apple store and they have taken the same path to get to the Apple store, mm -hmm. then uh, is it the case that one of them is probably allocated to uh, T3 and the other one could be allocated to the location-based targeting? Or is it the case that there is a third person who is standing in front of Apple but had a very different trajectory and is allocated to the location-based targeting? No, so, oh, oh, I see what you mean. Are you asking if I'm using, if you're using the similarity information uh, in the first 10 minutes, and then if two people have the exact same trajectories, are we putting them in the same uh, trajectory group versus two people have different trajectories? Correct. 
So I'm, I'm, I'm essentially my question is about selection into the different groups, right? And whether the selection is conditional on trajectory, which is what we are interested in studying, right. or is it independent of uh, trajectory? No, the selection is independent of the trajectory. So, okay. uh, and I think this is, again, you ask a very good question. This, and sorry, I didn't clarify that. The selection is independent of the trajectory because then, um, you know, it helps us ascertain the incremental effect of each of these treatments. Okay, fair enough, sounds good, thank yeah. you. Okay, we're gonna take last question for Marco and the rest of the questions, I guess, will have to be offline. Sure. Send me whatever questions, uh, and here's my email address. Okay, well, thanks to everyone. Uh, I was wondering um, whether you have uh, data on returning customers so that you can track uh, how quickly they return depending on the treatment and how their purchasing behavior will change so that it's not just the intertemporal substitution effect. Uh, unfortunately, no, Marco, we don't have the returning customers and I'll tell you why. Um, it has primarily to do with the privacy aspect of this. So um, what happens is if you want to track the return customer, right? So it, technologically you can do it because you know the, uh, the, uh, the uh, unique identifiers from each phone, once they come back, uh, will give us the, uh, the, you know, the information about whether it's the same customer or a new customer. So we can do that. Uh, but that's something, that level of tracking, um, you know, we could not, it's hard to convince them all that, you know, let us do that. So we couldn't do the return customer ana analysis. However, one thing we have done is we followed up with a survey, Marco, um, for all the customers and we asked them the probability of their future redemption. Okay, so in the paper and in, in tables as well. There you will see that the, the based on the survey responses, we do find that there is a significantly higher probability of future redemption by the trajectory-based customers. So they are alluding to the fact that yes, they are very likely to come back, uh, but we don't know for a fact if they eventually came back or not. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay um, I think Christian has some announcements to make, but first maybe I can unmute everybody so we can take them to speaker. Um, okay, let's do it. Um, better. Okay. So thanks, Anandia, for this uh, super fascinating talk. Uh, I just wanted to announce real quickly that we have a panel discussion next week uh, on merger policy in digital markets. Um, we're very much looking forward to have Luis Cabral, Fiona Scott Morton, and Tomaso Valetti.